Acute kidney injury is a common problem seen in hospitalized patients, so the diagnosis, workup, and treatment of AKI is extremely high yield for the USMLE Step 2. In this section, we'll discuss acute tubular necrosis, hepatorenal syndrome, atheroemboli, acute or allergic interstitial nephritis, and analgesic nephropathy. Acute kidney injury was previously known as acute renal failure, or ARF, so don't be confused if you see it described this way in some textbooks. You also might see definitions of AKI in older textbooks that say something like a 50% rise in creatinine above baseline, or an absolute rise of 0.5 in the creatinine. However, on the USMLE Step 2, they will not ask you a definition type question like this, and that's because the most current definition of AKI is not based on any one specific number. Rather, acute kidney injury is defined as a decrease in creatinine clearance that results in a sudden rise in BUN and creatinine. So remember, the most current definition, the testable definition, is not based on any specific value of BUN and creatinine. The three main etiologies of AKI are classified by their relationship to the kidney. Prerenal azotemia is a problem with perfusion or adequate volume to the kidney. Postrenal azotemia is a problem with obstruction of urine flowing from the kidney. And lastly, intrinsic renal disease is usually a result of an ischemic or toxic insult to the kidney itself. Now let's talk about the specific etiologies for acute kidney injury in a little more detail. Remember again that the categories of AKI are classified based on their relationship to the kidney itself. Those categories again, pre-renal, intrinsic renal, and post-renal. Now pre-renal and post-renal etiologies together make up for more than 80% of all causes of AKI. And that's actually a really good thing if you're the patient, because in these cases, the AKI is reversible if you correct the underlying problem. Under the umbrella of prerenal causes, what all of these have in common is that the kidney sees a decrease in effective circulating volume. This can happen in the setting of hypotension for various reasons, such as sepsis, anaphylaxis, bleeding, and dehydration. It can also be seen in the setting of hypovolemia. This happens when diuretics are aggressively used, in burn patients, in pancreatitis where we see the third spacing of fluid, decreased cardiac output or forward blood flow, like in the setting of systolic heart failure, low albumin states for various reasons like severe malnutrition or nephrotic syndrome, or in cirrhotic patients. Other causes of prerenal AKI are renal artery stenosis, where the blood vessel leading to the kidney itself is narrowed. Also in NSAID use, because NSAIDs constrict the afferent arteriole, while ACE inhibitors dilate the efferent arteriole. One thing to keep in mind about all of these prerenal etiologies is that you'll see the elevated BUN to creatinine ratio of greater than 20 to 1. But we'll talk about that more a little bit later. Under the umbrella of intrinsic renal causes of AKI, far and away the most common is going to be ATN, or acute tubular necrosis. Causes of ATN are typically uh, either from toxins or from ischemia. So under the toxins category, the toxins most commonly leading to acute tubular necrosis include NSAIDs, aminoglycosides, and amphotericin. And amphotericin is actually nicknamed amphoterrible because it so often causes intrinsic ATN. Cisplatin and cyclosporine can also cause ATN. And again, prolonged ischemia, uh, or stopping the blood flow leading to the kidney, can also eventually lead to acute tubular necrosis. Acute interstitial nephritis, or AIN, is an allergic response to medications. And these medications are different 
than the drugs associated with ATN. So it's important to keep these distinct in your mind. The way I like to think about it is that the drugs that lead to AIN are drugs that patients are often allergic to. So what drug allergies do you see most commonly? Well, you see penicillin allergies and you see sulfa allergies. So the sulfa-containing drugs to remember, the most common ones, are trimsulfa, or Bactrim, an antibiotic, furosemide contains a sulfa group, and so does hydrochlorothiazide. In the setting of AIN, uh, you can tell that from the other intrinsic renal causes, because in the clinical vignette, they'll often describe other systemic signs of an allergic reaction. They may describe that the patient has a drug rash, or they may describe eosinophils either in the urine or in the peripheral blood. Rhabdo or hemoglobinuria can also cause intrinsic uh, AKI, as can contrast, it causes a special type called contrast-induced nephropathy, crystals, which deposit in the tubules, Benz-Jones proteins in the setting of multiple myeloma, and in the setting of post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. When you think of post-renal AKI, think about urinary obstruction. Usually, obstruction at the level of the kidney and ureter is not enough to cause AKI unless the patient only has one kidney. So the sites of obstruction to think about as causing post-renal AKI are the prostate, so in the setting of uh, prostatic hypertrophy or really bad prostate cancer, a stone that gets caught in the urethra, Cervical cancer, if it gets really large and obstructive, can cause post-renal AKI. A stone in the urethra, neurogenic bladder, or retroperitoneal fibrosis. Usually this happens as a complication of either chemo or radiation therapy. So AKI, regardless of the etiology, is typically a diagnosis made by laboratory values and not by patient complaints. Traditional symptoms, if they occur, are nausea and vomiting, fatigue and malaise, weakness, or symptoms of volume overload, like shortness of breath or edema. Other presenting symptoms are usually cause-specific and depend on what caused the AKI in the first place. If the AKI is very severe, your patient may present with confusion from the buildup of uremic toxins, arrhythmia from hyperkalemia and acidosis as a result from the kidney not functioning properly, and a sharp pleuritic chest pain uh, that's worse with inspiration, characteristic of uremic pericarditis. So what does the USMLE Step 2 love to ask? What is the best initial test for AKI? Well, this answer is pretty easy. Since we just said that AKI is a laboratory diagnosis, we have to know those labs, right? The BUN and creatinine are essential for making the diagnosis of AKI. In non-functional kidneys, from the point of injury, the creatinine will rise one point per day, uh, or one milligram per deciliter per day. Not only the absolute values of BUN and creatinine, but the BUN to creatinine ratio can also be helpful. If the BUN to creatinine ratio is greater than 20 to 1, you're more likely to think about either pre-renal or post-renal causes as the reason for the AKI. In the setting of intrinsic renal disease, that BUN to creatinine ratio is closer to 10 to 1. If laboratory values, including BUN and creatinine, have already been given in your clinical vignette, and the question asks you for the next best test, the best choice would be a renal sonogram. If hydronephrosis is present, or if the bladder is distended, this is highly suggestive of a post-renal etiology. And as it says on the slide, it's a great first test because it's not invasive, doesn't have a lot of side effects, and it doesn't need contrast. Really, the diagnosis of pre-renal and post-renal etiologies of AKI will be highly suggested by the history, uh, either given as hypoperfusion or hypotension, or a history of urinary retention. And although biopsy is the most accurate test for acute interstitial nephritis or post-strep glomerular nephritis, it's rare for any cause of AKI to actually need a biopsy 
So the history is the best way to make the diagnosis of what caused the AKI. But what if there are no clues present in the history to suggest what may have triggered it? In cases like these, you have to order a more extensive workup. The tests you'll want to order include urinalysis, urine sodium, other urine electrolytes, so you can calculate the fractional excretion of sodium or urea, known commonly as phena and pheurea, and urine osmolality. If you had to prioritize these tests, I would go with urinalysis as the best first one. Urine electrolytes are particularly helpful in determining when AKI is caused by a pre-renal etiology. In normal kidneys, when the blood pressure drops, the normal response is to have increased aldosterone released from the adrenals. Aldosterone is a hormone that leads to increased sodium reabsorption in the distal part of the nephron, and when more sodium is reabsorbed, there's less sodium present in the urine. That's why when the kidneys themselves are functioning normal, and the problem is upstream of the kidney, like in pre-renal AKI, there's going to be an appropriately low amount of sodium in the urine. So in pre-renal AKI, the urine sodium should be less than 20. On the flip side, in the case of a damaged kidney, where the problem is intrinsic to the kidney itself, like in acute tubular necrosis, the kidneys are damaged, so they're not able to reabsorb sodium appropriately. Therefore, the levels of sodium in the urine are going to be inappropriately high, or greater than 20. So what do we need to commit to memory? Pre-renal azotemia is going to have a low urine sodium, less than 20, and that's going to lead to a low fractional excretion of sodium, less than 1%. The nice thing to know is that you can answer all questions on the USMLE Step 2 without knowing the mathematical formula for FENA. I don't even know it. Uh, in the wards, we usually use our med calc and calculate it when we need to. So for the USMLE Step 2, just remember the cutoffs. You're in sodium less than 20 and FENA less than 1%. Urine osmolality gives you similar information about the etiology of a patient's AKI. We talked about aldosterone already, but the other hormone that becomes elevated in the setting of intravascular depletion is antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone acts on the collecting duct of the nephron to reabsorb water and concentrate the urine. Therefore, if the kidney is functioning normally and the problem is pre-renal or upstream of the kidney, the collecting duct is going to be able to function properly under the influence of ADH and it will lead to a high urine osmolality. If the kidney is damaged, such as cases of intrinsic AKI, the urine can't be effectively concentrated. So in the cases of intrinsic AKI, the urine osmolality can't get much higher than the blood osmolality and that number is 300 osmolality. So what's the $10 word that you need to know for the inability to concentrate the urine? That $10 word is isothenuria. Isothenuria is also seen in sickle cell patients, and that includes carriers of the sickle cell trait. We'll also have this impaired ability to concentrate the urine. We'll discuss such a patient in the next clinical vignette. So here's our clinical vignette. We have a 20-year-old African-American man who has a screening test for sickle cell. He's found to be heterozygous for sickle cell, which means he has sickle cell trait, or he's a carrier. What's the best advice for him? Our answer choices are, nothing's needed until he has a painful crisis, he should avoid dehydration, he should take hydroxyurea, he should take folic acid supplementation, or he should receive a pneumococcal vaccination. So what's the correct answer? It's B, avoid dehydration. The only significant manifestation of sickle cell trait is a defect in the renal concentrating ability, that $10 word we discussed, isothenuria. These patients will continue to produce inappropriately dilute high volume urine despite dehydration, so the best advice is to maintain adequate fluid intake. So now that we know that B is the correct answer, let's take a look at why the other answer choices are wrong. A is wrong, nothing is needed until he has a painful crisis, 
because actually patients with sickle cell traits rarely experience pain crisis to begin with. Similarly, C is wrong because hydroxyurea is only indicated in patients who have more than four pain crises per year. Folic acid supplementation is sometimes indicated in patients with sickle cell anemia, but only if they have severe hemolysis. Hemolysis leads to high red blood cell turnover, and to regenerate the lost red blood cells, folic acid is needed. Pneumococcal vaccination is wrong because that's really only indicated in functionally asplenic patients, which rarely happens in people with sickle cell trait. So now let's review the laboratory tests that help us determine whether AKI is caused by pre-renal azotemia or acute tubular necrosis. The first test we discussed was that BUN to creatinine ratio. In pre-renal azotemia, that ratio is going to be greater than 20 to 1, whereas in acute tubular necrosis, the ratio is going to be less than 20 to 1, sometimes closer to 10 to 1. The next laboratory test we discussed was the urine sodium concentration. Now remember, in pre-renal azotemia, the kidney itself is normal, so the kidneys are going to be able to appropriately reabsorb sodium, leading to an appropriately low urine sodium concentration. The number to memorize is less than 20 milliequivalents per liter. That's in contrast to acute tubular necrosis where the kidney itself is damaged. The damaged kidney can't appropriately reabsorb sodium, so that leads to an inappropriately high urine sodium concentration. For the fractional excretion of sodium, and remember you don't have to memorize this formula, just the cutoff values. For prerenal azotemia, the FENA is less than 1%. And for acute tubular necrosis, the FENA is greater than 1%. Lastly, we discussed urine osmolality. In prerenal azotemia, again, the kidney is functioning normally, so we're going to produce appropriately concentrated urine. So if we measure the osmolality of the urine in pre-renal azotemia, it's going to be high, or greater than 500. In the case of acute tubular necrosis, the kidney itself is not able to concentrate the urine appropriately, so we'll see isothenuria, or the inability to concentrate the urine, more than 300. As we discussed before, acute tubular necrosis is caused by an injury to the kidneys from either ischemia or toxins. This leads to tubular cells dying, sloughing off, and being lost in the urine. We talked about the specific etiologies already, and knowing these etiologies is crucial since there's really no specific diagnostic test to prove the etiology. One thing to remember, though, is that you won't see significant proteinuria. That's because proteinuria occurs when the glomeruli are damaged, and ATN is a problem with the tubules. So you really can't do a blood level of a drug or a biopsy to prove that a particular toxin caused the renal failure, so your best clues are going to be in the clinical vignette when either toxin ingestion or uh, ischemia are described. Those are really going to be your best clues to answer the what is the most likely diagnosis question. So let's apply what we've just discussed about ATN to a clinical vignette. Here we have a patient who presents with fever and acute left lower quadrant abdominal pain. The blood cultures grow E. coli in candida albicans, so the patient is started on vancomycin, metronidazole, gentamicin, and amphotericin. A CT scan reveals diverticulitis, and after 36 hours, her creatinine rises dramatically. So which of the following is the most likely cause of her renal insufficiency? Our answer choices are vancomycin, gentamicin, contrast media, metronidazole, and amphotericin. So this question is actually kind of tricky because this poor lady has been exposed to multiple nephrotoxic agents that could have caused AKI. So when we're given so many answer choices that could cause AKI, how can we tell which one it was? Now you notice in the clinical vignette that they told us the creatinine rises after 36 hours. And on the USMLE Step 2, they won't give you timing information like that for no reason. Actually here, the timing between insults 
and the rise in creatinine is crucial to answering this question. So with so many nephrotoxic agents, what was the cause of her renal insufficiency? The correct answer is C, contrast media. This is correct because radiographic contrast media has a very rapid onset of injury. Typically, the creatinine is going to rise anywhere between 24 and 48 hours after the administration of contrast. This is different from drug-induced ATN. Uh, vancomycin, gentamicin, and amphotericin, they're all nephrotoxic, but they typically don't cause renal failure until 5 to 10 days of exposure has passed. Metronidazole is really the lone answer choice here that isn't known to cause acute kidney injury because it's hepatically excreted. Let's take a look at another clinical vignette. Here we have a 74-year-old blind man admitted with obstructive uropathy and chest pain. He has a history of hypertension and diabetes, and his creatinine drops from 10 mg per deciliter to 1.2 mg per deciliter three days after a Foley catheter is placed. Subsequently, a stress test shows reversible ischemia. So what's the most appropriate management? Our answer choices are A, coronary artery calcium score on CT scan, B, 1 to 2 liters of normal saline hydration prior and during angiography, C, N-acetylcysteine prior to angiography, D, mannitol during angiography, E, furosemide during angiography, or F, intravenous sodium bicarbonate before and during angiography. So when we were first reading this question, it seemed like they were asking us a cardiology question. But actually, the question is asking, how do we prevent contrast-induced nephropathy? With a positive stress test showing reversible ischemia, this gentleman is going to need a cardiac catheterization. And cardiac catheterizations require an immense amount of contrast media. Now this guy had an obstructive AKI, right, a post-renal AKI, because his creatinine was high and it improved after his bladder was decompressed with Foley catheter placement. So the question here is, in a patient with recent kidney injury, how do we prevent contrast-induced nephropathy with an intervention before, during, or after contrast administration? So what's the correct answer? Although several of them look tempting, the best answer for the USMLE Step 2 is B, 1 to 2 liters of normal saline prior and during angiography. Saline hydration has the most proven benefit of preventing contrast-induced nephropathy. Uh, the rest of these, although sometimes done by practitioners, either in the hospital or in the clinic, they don't have as strong of evidence. A coronary artery calcium score is still considered an experimental intervention. So experimental treatments are never the correct answer as most appropriate management on the USMLE Step 2. N-acetylcysteine is sometimes ordered by doctors for their patients before they go to angiography, but the evidence here isn't as strong. Mannitol really doesn't have any proven benefit. Furosemide actually can worsen the effects of AKI because it leads to dehydration. Sodium bicarb is another thing that sometimes doctors will order uh, in real life, but it's not the correct answer on the USMLE Step 2 because the evidence is not as strong. Let's take a look at our next clinical vignette. Here we have a patient with mild renal insufficiency who undergoes angiography and subsequently develops a 2 mg per deciliter rise in creatinine from ATN despite the use of saline hydration before and after the procedure. So the question is, what would we expect to find on laboratory testing? And taking a look at the answer choices, we see varying levels of urine sodium, fractional excretion of sodium, and urine-specific gravity. Urine-specific gravity is another marker to measure how concentrated the urine is. A low urine-specific gravity correlates with dilute urine, and a high urine-specific gravity correlates with very concentrated urine. So, what is this question really asking? This question is asking, where does contrast-induced nephropathy fit in? What category is it in?
And they don't call this an extra difficult question for nothing, because uh, it's not very straightforward. Contrast-induced nephropathy technically is considered a form of acute tubular necrosis. So with acute tubular necrosis, as we talked about previously, we would expect a high urine sodium, a fena greater than 1%, and the inability to concentrate the urine, or a low urine-specific gravity. So if we were thinking of looking for laboratory values consistent with ATN, B would look like a good answer choice. However, contrast-induced nephropathy is the exception to the rule, and you should remember that for test day. The correct answer here is actually C. And that's because contrast causes a spasm of the afferent arterial that leads to renal tubular dysfunction. Because of that, there's going to be a tremendous amount of sodium absorbed in the tubule. That leads to very low urine sodium and a low fractional excretion of sodium as well. Because sodium and water are reabsorbed at such massive amounts, the urine is going to be very concentrated with a very high urine specific gravity. That's different from the typical findings that we would see in ATN from other nephrotoxins. Let's take a look at another extra difficult question. Here we have a patient with extremely severe myeloma and a plasma cytoma. They're admitted for initiation of combination chemotherapy, and two days after starting that chemotherapy, the creatinine rises. So which of the following is the most likely cause? Our answer choices are cisplatin, hyperuricemia, Bentz-Jones proteinuria, hypercalcemia, or hyperoxaluria. So this question's tricky. Like the previous question, this patient has multiple exposures to multiple things that could cause acute kidney injury. So what do you do when you have multiple answer choices that could cause AKI? Well, you go back, you look in the clinical vignette, and you hunt for clues as to timing. Because timing can often be the factor that helps you decide between different etiologies of AKI. In this case, the time course was two days. There was two days between the initiating event, or starting chemotherapy, and the rise in creatinine. So of these answer choices, which one is most likely to cause AKI after two days? The correct answer? Hyperuricemia or choice B. This is correct because in patients with hematologic malignancies who undergo treatment with strong chemotherapy, what they're at risk for is a condition known as tumor lysis syndrome. And tumor lysis syndrome is just what it sounds like. When the chemotherapy starts to act, the tumor cells are going to break apart and spill their intracellular contents into the blood. One thing present in these tumor cells is DNA, and when the DNA gets broken down, it leads to elevated uric acid levels in the bloodstream. The uric acid can deposit in the tubules, and that leads to ATN, typically two days after the initiation of chemo. So why are the other answer choices wrong? Cisplatin is wrong because, like most drugs, it takes five to ten days of exposure for it to cause a toxin-related ATN. Benz-Jones proteinuria and hypercalcemia can both lead to kidney damage, but there's really no reason that both of these should get worse two days after starting treatment. If anything, they should get better. The final answer, hyperoxaluria, when oxalate is present in the urine, it can deposit in tubules and cause renal insufficiency, but cancer patients undergoing treatment aren't really at risk for elevated oxalate levels. This is typically seen in patients who have recently undergone a bowel resection. So what might have prevented this event in our patient with multiple myeloma? Typically, the preventative medications we give somebody starting cancer treatment who's at risk for tumor lysis syndrome are allopurinol to control the uric acid, hydration because dilution is the solution to pollution, and rasburicase. These are given prior to the initiation of chemotherapy, and they can prevent renal failure developing from tumor lysis syndrome. Now let's talk about one last extra difficult question. Here we have a suicidal patient who ingests an unknown substance and develops renal failure three days later. Her calcium level is low, and urinalysis shows an abnormality. What did she take? 
Our options are aspirin, acetaminophen, ethylene glycol, ibuprofen, opiates, and methanol. So certainly all of these medicines can be taken in intentional overdoses for a suicide attempt, and several of them actually can cause kidney damage. So how do we go about picking the correct answer? The big clue in the question stem here is that the calcium level is also low. There's only one of these answer choices that both causes renal failure and hypocalcemia. The correct answer is ethylene glycol. So ethylene glycol causes acute kidney injury because of oxalic acid and oxalate that precipitate within the kidney tubules. The damage to the kidney tubules leads to acute tubular necrosis and intrinsic AKI. The buzzword to remember for test day when the clinical vignette is pushing you towards ethylene glycol poisoning is the presence of envelope-shaped crystals in the urine. You'll also see hypocalcemia in cases of ethylene glycol poisoning because oxalate precipitates with calcium and lowers the level of free calcium in the blood. So why are the other answer choices wrong? Aspirin is certainly nephrotoxic, but it has no effect on calcium levels or cause abnormalities on your analysis, so it's not the correct answer to this question. Acetaminophen can often cause really bad effects when taken in overdose, but it's hepatotoxic and not nephrotoxic. Ibuprofen, like we talked about with all NSAIDs, constricts the afferent arterial. That leads to acute tubular necrosis or papillary necrosis. And papillary necrosis is actually a really common clinical vignette that they might describe on step two. Uh, in a patient with papillary necrosis, they'll describe sudden onset of flank pain and fever which wasn't described in this clinical vignette. Opiates by themselves aren't really associated with kidney damage, but injection drug use, like heroin, is sometimes associated with focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. This isn't the actual opiate itself, but the impurities in the injection drug use. Finally, methanol. Methanol's main toxicity is retinal inflammation, so they wouldn't necessarily present with AKI or hypocalcemia. So now that we've discussed toxins that can lead to acute tubular necrosis, you should know that there are three major risk factors that make you even more likely to suffer the consequences of a toxic ATN. Those are hypoperfusion, so if you have decreased perfusion to the kidney and toxic insult, the two are more likely to combine together to worsen AKI. Underlying renal insufficiency, so if you have low kidney reserve to begin with, you're more likely to take a hit in the presence of a toxin. And underlying renal insufficiency can be caused by either hypertension or diabetes. And finally, older age. People in general lose about 1% of their renal function every year after age 40. So older folks are much likely, much more sensitive to toxic insult leading to an ATN. Before we move on, let's review some key differences you may see in a clinical vignette to help you distinguish between causes of ATN. So remember, drug-induced toxicity usually takes five to 10 days of exposure. And the drugs you'll want to remember that can cause ATN are aminoglycosides, amphotericin or amphotericin, cisplatin, vancomycin, acyclovir, and cyclosporine. Also remember that the probability of developing drug-related ATN is definitely dose-dependent. Um, also, in the setting of low magnesium, that increases the risk of specifically aminoglycoside and cisplatin-related ATN. Contrast-induced nephropathy happens much more quickly. The time window typically is 24 to 48 hours after contrast exposure. So if the clinical vignette describes a CT scan with contrast for uh, looking for a PE or some abscess, or in the setting of coronary angiography, if they develop kidney injury 24 to 48 hours later, the most likely culprit is going to be the contrast. Remember also that contrast-induced nephropathy is best prevented with normal saline hydration, both before, during, and after the exposure. 
other therapies are sometimes used but haven't been proven with the amount of data behind saline hydration. N-acetylcysteine and sodium bicarb, you may see your attendings or colleagues using it in the hospitals, but they haven't been consistently proven as beneficial. Other causes of acute tubular necrosis include hemoglobin and myoglobin, like in the case of rhabdomyolysis, we'll talk more about this later, hyperuricemia, either in the setting of tumor lysis syndrome or chronically in gout that keeps getting worse, ethylene glycol poisoning, causing the precipitation of calcium oxalate crystals, which are envelope-shaped, which deposit in the renal cortex, multiple myeloma leading to Bentz-Jones proteins that are also toxic to the renal tubules, and NSAIDs, which cause ischemia due to constriction of the afferent arterial. Rhabdomyolysis is a highly tested concept on the USMLE Step 2. Things to know about rhabdomyolysis include the etiologies. Uh, the most common etiologies are trauma, prolonged immobility, snake bite, seizure, and crush injury. The best test when you're suspecting rhabdomyolysis is a urinalysis, and here we want both the dipstick and the microscopic analysis of the urine. What will you find? You'll find blood positive on the dipstick, but no red blood cells seen on the microscopic exam. That's because the dipstick tests positive anytime there's hemoglobin or myoglobin present. And myoglobin and hemoglobin are present in rhabdomyolysis without red blood cells because the hemoglobin and myoglobin have come from cells that have lysed. So now that we've discussed the best initial test, another question you may receive about rhabdo is the most specific lab test. In that case, the correct answer is urine myoglobin. Other abnormal lab findings that they may describe in the clinical vignette include elevated creatinine phosphokinase, or CPK, hyperkalemia, because as muscle cells break down, they release their intracellular potassium, hyperuricemia, because uric acid is also present intracellularly, and elevated phosphate. All of these substances are elevated in rhabdomyolysis because they are all present in high concentrations inside the cells, and they spill out into the serum when cells are damaged. Hypocalcemia is often also found because calcium in the body binds to the excess phosphate in the serum. The last topic of questions related to rhabdo is how we treat it. So the mainstay of treatment is going to be vigorous fluid resuscitation with normal saline. My pharmacology professor always used to say the solution to pollution is dilution. For the same reason, Manitol, which is an osmotic diuretic, can be used to increase urinary flow and dilute the toxic hemoglobin and myoglobin in the urine. Finally, bicarbonate is sometimes used because it acts to drive potassium back into the cells and may prevent the precipitation of myoglobin inside the kidney tubule. Remember, we don't want to treat hypocalcemia in rhabdomyolysis if it's asymptomatic. In the recovery, as we promote the excretion of the myoglobin and hemoglobin, the calcium will just come back uh, out of the muscles by itself. Now let's apply what we've learned to a clinical vignette. Here we have a man who comes into the emergency department after a triathlon, followed by status epilepticus. He takes simvastatin at triple the recommended dose. His muscles are tender and his urine is dark. IV fluids are started. What is the next best step in management. So if this question came up on my screen during step two, I would key in on the actual question first. What is the next best step? The actual clinical vignette here gives you every keyword for rhabdomyolysis under the sun, so you don't want to get caught up of which of these risk factors is actually causing his rhabdo. What are our answer choices? The answer choices here are CPK level, EKG, potassium replacement, urine dipstick, and urine myoglobin. So you might be tempted to choose urinalysis because we discussed that as the best first test to diagnose rhabdo. Or you might be tempted to choose urine myoglobin because we discussed that as the most specific test for rhabdo. CPK is another good one because it's usually high in rhabdo. However, 
when you're faced with the question, what is the next best step in management? The best way to go is to identify potentially life-threatening complications and address those first. Therefore, the correct answer in this question is to obtain an EKG. An EKG should always be done first and foremost any time rhabdomyolysis is suspected because as we discussed, when muscle cells are breaking down, the intracellular potassium leaks into the serum. Hyperkalemia can lead to fatal arrhythmias, so we always want to identify those with EKG and initiate appropriate treatment before we go about diagnosing and confirming the rhabdomyolysis that started it all. So to review, why are the rest of these wrong? CPK is wrong because it would diagnose rhabdo, but wouldn't address the life-threatening complication. Potassium replacement is actually the worst thing you could do for this patient because their potassium is likely to be high in the first place. Urine dipstick, again, would diagnose the rhabdo but wouldn't prevent the patient from suffering the fatal complications of it. And neuron myoglobin, again, same reason as above. Unfortunately, there haven't been any therapies that have proven benefit in patients with ATN. Typically, we just kind of have to let them write it out. While we're managing them, the things we keep in mind is if they're volume depleted, we give them fluid hydration, and if we find any electrolyte abnormalities, obviously it's best to correct them. Sometimes we give diuretics in the setting of acute tubular necrosis, and this increases the urine output, but it's important to know that it doesn't change the overall outcome. If you have a patient with acute tubular necrosis and they start peeing more because you're giving them furosemide, it doesn't necessarily mean that their renal failure is reversing. It just means that the diuretics are doing their job. Answering treatment questions for acute tubular necrosis is mainly based on recognizing the most common wrong answers. Things that we don't do for ATN include low-dose dopamine, diuretics, mannitol, steroids, as all of these are ineffective in reversing acute tubular necrosis. Again, the best way to treat ATN is to identify and correct the underlying cause. So if we cannot identify or correct the underlying cause of acute tubular necrosis, sometimes dialysis is necessary. So how do you know? When is dialysis the answer? On USMLE Step 2 or in real life? Dialysis is initiated in five specific instances. We do dialysis when the patients are severely fluid overloaded and aren't responding to diuretics, when they're encephalopathic from the effects of uremic toxins, when they develop pericarditis as a manifestation of uremia, when they develop a severe metabolic acidosis that's life-threatening, or in the setting of severe hyperkalemia that's symptomatic with peaked T waves. My favorite mnemonic for remembering the acute indications for dialysis is AEIOU. A for acidosis, E for electrolyte imbalance, I for intoxication, because acute dialysis is also indicated in ethylene glycol poisoning and lithium overdose, O is for overload of volume, and U is for uremia, either manifest as pericarditis or encephalopathy. So let's take a look at another clinical vignette. Here we have a patient who develops acute tubular necrosis from gentamicin. She is vigorously hydrated and treated with high doses of a diuretic, low doses of dopamine, and calcium acetate as a phosphate binder. Urine output increases, but she still progresses to end-stage renal failure. She also becomes deaf. What is the cause of her hearing loss? So if you're like me, you're vigorously scanning the answer choices, desperately looking for gentamicin. Because as you probably remember from your step one studies, aminoglycosides are notorious for ototoxicity. However, we're not so lucky in this case. Our answer choices are hydrochlorothiazide, dopamine, furosemide, chlorothalidone, and calcium acetate. There's no aminoglycoside to be found. So what is the correct answer in this case? The correct answer is furosemide. If you didn't know it already, you should know that furosemide can also cause damage to the hair cells of the cochlea. Uh, this results in a sensory neural type of hearing loss. 
Remember that it's not only related to the total dose, but it's also related to how fast it's injected, because essentially it burns the inner ear. Uh, furosemide and ATN adds no proven overall benefit, so remember that diuretics are not a good treatment for treating acute tubular necrosis. It just adds to the ototoxicity that may have already been started by the gentamicin. So why are the other answer choices wrong? Briefly, hydrochlorothiazide has no ototoxicity. Dopamine as well. Chlorothalidone, not associated with ototoxicity, and neither is calcium acetate. So remember, aminoglycosides are your typical culprit for damage to the inner ear, but furosemide also has a toxic effect on those hair cells in the cochlea. As the name would suggest, Hepatorenal syndrome is kidney dysfunction that's secondary to hepatic failure. The thing to remember about hepatorenal syndrome is that the kidneys themselves are normal. And if you were to magically transplant a normal liver into a patient with hepatorenal syndrome, their kidney function would return to normal instantly. Things to look out for in a clinical vignette to suggest hepatorenal syndrome are a patient who either you're told has severe liver disease, you're given LFTs to suggest severe cirrhosis, or they describe characteristic physical exam findings like the spider angiomata, the nodular cirrhotic liver, or ascites to suggest severe liver disease. So you'll see these suggestive findings of severe liver disease and the description of new onset renal failure with no other explanation. Now hepatorenal syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion but some diagnostic tests can be helpful. For urine electrolytes, very low urine sodium, the same range that you would see in pre-renal AKI, is seen in hepatorenal syndrome. Likewise, the FENA is less than 1%, and the BUN to creatinine ratio is elevated, greater than 20 to 1. So all of the urine studies are consistent with the pre-renal etiology. However, in the setting of liver dysfunction, you might suspect hepatorenal syndrome as the cause. So once you suspect hepatorenal syndrome, how do you treat it? The mainstays of treatment here are albumin, midadrine, and octreotide. Atheroemboli can cause kidney disease when deposits of cholesterol dislodge from the walls of vessels and travel through the bloodstream to the kidney. They can occur during any procedure using a catheter. The most common ones they might describe are cardiac catheterization or angiogram. The emboli, once they're dislodged, can go to the kidney, leading to acute kidney injury. They can go to the eye, leading to sudden blindness. Cutaneous vessels, causing a rash known as livido reticularis. And the lab findings in atheroemboli include eosinophilia or eosilophenuria, low complement, an elevated ESR. The most accurate test to diagnose atheroemboli is a biopsy. What you'll see in that biopsy are cholesterol crystals deposited within the skin. Here we have a picture of livido reticularis, and livido reticularis is this purple blue net like skin finding. Typically, it's found on the extremities, such as the arm shown here. It's important to remember that on physical exam, the peripheral pulses are actually normal. These emboli that lodge in the vessels are too small to include vessels affecting pulse, such as the radial or the brachial artery. We talked a little bit already about acute or allergic interstitial nephritis. What happens in AIN is that antibodies and eosinophils attack cells that line the tubules of the kidney. Almost always, it's a reaction to drugs, 70% of causes. But AIN can also be caused by infection itself and by certain autoimmune disorders. The most common culprits in terms of drugs that cause AIN are the same medications that a patient might be allergic to. Most commonly, penicillins and cephalosporins, sulfa drugs like furosemide, hydrochlorothiazide, and trimsulfa, or Bactrim, phenytoin, rifampin, quinolones, allopurinol, and proton pump inhibitors.
Remember that the medications that cause acute interstitial nephritis are the same that cause other drug reactions, like drug allergy with rash, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis, and hemolysis. When faced with the question, what is the most likely diagnosis, it's important to remember that there are medications that are almost never associated with acute interstitial nephritis. These include calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, and SSRI antidepressants. These almost never cause AIN because they're inertly non-allergenic. So how will they describe a patient with acute interstitial nephritis on test day? Well, I like to remember that I want to look for signs and symptoms similar to a systemic allergic reaction because acute interstitial nephritis is basically an allergic reaction that manifests in the kidney. So with AIN, you'll see the characteristic rising BUN and creatinine seen in all forms of acute renal failure with some additional symptoms. 80% of patients will present with fever and about half of patients will have a rash. They may describe arthralgias, eosinophils in the blood and urine, and remember that acute interstitial nephritis is a form of intrinsic acute kidney injury. So you'll see that characteristic BUN to creatinine ratio of less than 20 to 1. Finally, if you do a urinalysis, you may see white and red blood cells in the urine. So out of all these symptoms, which is the most accurate test? The correct answer? The presence of eosinophils in the urine. And we can see eosinophils in the urine with the use of a right or Hansel stain. So in the USMLE step two, if a clinical vignette describes eosinophils in the urine or a positive right or Hansel stain, you've pretty much made your diagnosis of acute interstitial nephritis. Acute interstitial nephritis typically doesn't require any specific treatment. It usually resolves spontaneously after you stop the drug or control the infection that started it in the first place. If the creatinine continues to rise and you see manifestations of uremia, dialysis can be beneficial. Usually it's only temporary. If the creatinine continues to rise even after you stop the offending drug or treat the offending infection, Glucocorticoids like prednisone, hydrocortisone, or methylprednisolone is the correct answer. Analgesic nephropathy is a type of intrinsic acute kidney injury related to taking pain relievers. It presents as ATN from direct toxicity to the tubules. It can also manifest as acute interstitial nephritis, membranous glomerular nephritis, or papillary necrosis. The presentation you might see in a clinical vignette in a patient with analgesic nephropathy is vascular insufficiency of the kidney from inhibiting prostaglandins. Remember that the job of prostaglandins is to dilate the afferent arteriole, and NSAIDs inhibit prostaglandins, leading to constriction of the afferent arteriole. This decreases overall perfusion to the kidneys themselves. Usually, this Inhibition of prostaglandins is asymptomatic in patients who are healthy, but when patients are older or who have underlying renal insufficiency from diabetes or hypertension, the NSAIDs can tip them over the edge into clinically apparent renal insufficiency. Papillary necrosis is one manifestation of analgesic nephropathy. It occurs when the renal papillae flop off the surface of the kidney. The etiologies include NSAIDs or any other form of sudden vascular insufficiency, and that leads to the death of these cells in the papillae and their dropping off the internal structure of the kidney itself. Usually it occurs in conjunction with underlying kidney damage from things like sickle cell, diabetes, urinary obstruction, or chronic pyelonephritis. As far as clinical presentation, if the USMLE Step 2 is trying to describe a patient with papillary necrosis, they'll often describe sudden onset of fever, hematuria, and very sudden, very severe flank pain. For all the world, this looks just like pyelonephritis. So to tell papillary necrosis from pyelonephritis, what's the best first test? 
the best first test is going to be a urinalysis because in the case of papillary necrosis, the urinalysis will show red blood cells and white blood cells, possibly even necrotic tissue, but no bacteria. The most accurate test to confirm papillary necrosis is going to be a CT scan because you can actually show the internal structure of the kidney uh, that looks abnormal due to the loss of papillae. As far as treatment, unfortunately there's no specific therapy because we can't reattach a detached renal papilla. To review, let's go over the key differences between pyelonephritis and papillary necrosis. In terms of onset, pyelonephritis is a little more insidious. Patients will notice the symptoms coming on over a few days. In papillary necrosis, it's more acute in onset. Typically, the patients will notice symptoms over the course of a few hours. So what about those symptoms themselves? We've said they're similar. That's why it's sometimes tricky to tell them apart. But patients with pylo will often complain of dysuria, whereas patients with papillary necrosis may mention seeing necrotic material passing through their urine. Now, if you do a urine culture, a patient with pyelonephritis will have a positive urine culture. You'll see bacteria growing in the urine specimen. But patients with papillary necrosis will have sterile urine because the problem is not infectious. On CT scan, if pylo is the diagnosis, you'll see a diffusely swollen kidney, sometimes with an accompanying perinephric abscess. But in papillary necrosis, you'll see the bumpy contour of the kidney's interior where the papilla has detached. In terms of treatment, again in pylo, the problem is infectious, so you'll want to give the patient antibiotics. In severe infections, we use a combination of ampicillin and gentamicin, but fluoroquinolones can be used in less severe cases of pylo. Now remember, as we said, papillary necrosis doesn't really have a specific treatment because there's no way to reattach a detached papilla. And this concludes our section.